Hey, I'm Francisco, and I'm speaking with Eric Reese, who's the founder of this movement of going lean when you're building a company. Right, Eric? Yeah, <laughs> that's the idea. Given that you're creating a business around this topic, do you think that's the number one reason startups fail, that they spend too much money or spend it frivolously? It's, it's a question of uh, what do they spend it on and when do they spend it. Mm -hmm. um, so the kind of... The, the leading cause of premature mortality in startups, mm -hmm. uh, the root cause is building the wrong thing, right? right? Like there's not enough customers there when the after you do the launch and you're on TV and you, everything goes great. I, I had this experience building a virtual worlds company where you know, we had this amazing launch after being in you know doing stealth R&D for several years. And then this we were is in, in was that this is a previous company? Oh, okay. Where you know we had actually built the product for like three or four years in stealth. Like nobody knew about it, it was a secret, and then boom, we generated all this buzz, we had a great launch, we were in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, How CNN. How much did you raise? Uh, that company raised between 40 and 50 million dollars. Wow. Okay. So I mean, it was a major, major effort, it was something like 200 employees by the time customers saw the product. Mm. And here's the thing, it wasn't a bad product, it just wasn't good enough you know, in, on day one with its early adopter audience to justify this gargantuan burn rate that we had built. Right. Um, so, if we had saved that money, figured out not just what should the product be, but who's the customer, started to build that kind of drive the technology lifecycle adoption curve, like get to the chasm and then try to cross it, mm -hmm. husbanding our resources, mm -hmm. then I think when we finally got to the point of reaching mainstream customers, we could have spent $50 million or more really productively. Right. So right. the question is, uh, do you know what you're going to get from the money that you spent? And of course, Every entrepreneur thinks they know. Right. It says it right there in the business plan. My VCs agreed with me, so that I must be a genius, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But, you know, everything in a business plan, as one of my mentors, Steve Blank, likes to say, is a hypothesis, right. which is a fancy word for guess. Mm -hmm. The goal of a lean startup is to validate those hypotheses in a systematic way mm -hmm. before we spend all our money. Right. So that if any of them are wrong, mm -hmm. we have a chance to learn and adjust you know, before it's too late. So what are the, not many people are going to be yeah. raising 40, 50 million dollars these days, but they not, will yeah. be raising 5, 10 million dollars and they yeah. can make the same, very same mistakes. Absolutely. You can make this mistake on, you know, $100,000 or $100 million. Right. Structurally, right. it doesn't matter. So then, let's start from the beginning. You have some startups that to want to start a business, they're going to have, you know, say half a million dollars to a million dollars. Yeah. These are the guys who are listening to you right now, too. Yeah. So what should they do? Should they start, uh, spend? You know, if you have a million dollars, spend, you know, make that last for two years. Is that the right approach to say, okay, let that last for two years, build a product, get it out right away, get customer feedback? Right. Well, the, 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 in order to answer the question, the, there isn't like a quick rule of thumb. You have to yeah. really get into, okay, well, why do we raise money? What's the purpose of it mm -hmm. in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 this isn't always what entrepreneurs want to hear, mm -hmm. but what matters is not how much runway you have left. It doesn't matter how much money you have. What matters is how many iterations do you have left. I love that article that you right. have. Yeah, that you we can have read it on Vader TV, yeah. Cash, cash is not king. It's the number of our iterations a startup has left. So explain that. Yeah, so, so you know, last year especially... I love that because a lot yeah. of people don't have much cash, so they're going to love that. That's <laughs> right. Well, and, and the, remember, you know, remember, you know, RIP good times, and there was this whole, you know, effort to get entrepreneurs to, to cut costs and cut burn. Mm -hmm. And a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, I remember asking their VCs for advice. They said, okay, you said to cut costs. Okay, I will. Which right. costs should I cut? VC would say, oh, I don't know. That's, not, that's your department. You're exactly. the entrepreneur. Yeah. If you cut the costs that are allowing you to do your fundamental work, mm -hmm. then you're just going out of business more slowly. Mm -hmm. That's not actually a win. Mm -hmm. So if you, like, look at this, uh, how did successful startups, how did it work out? Mm -hmm. You know, it's very rare for the initial idea to be the one that is the final idea that actually works. Mm -hmm. They do this thing we call the pivot which, you know, entrepreneurs encounter difficulty, and instead yeah. of giving up, they change direction. Sure. So, you know, PayPal is my per current favorite example. They started off doing digital cyber cash for PDAs, and they're doing, you know, email payments, and they wind up, you know, doing online commerce for eBay. Well, I heard that they had, like, what, 40 or something um, employees before they, and then they decided to pivot again. And they yeah, had yeah, and they did, it, they did it in a relatively non-lean way, because they, they were at a time when you were raising absolutely gargantuan amounts of money was yeah. possible. Um, and people get confused. They had been, They also were in a market that required massive spending on customer acquisition to mm -hmm. lock up the network effects once they yeah. were successful. Yes. But they also spent a lot of money before they had that product market fit while they were still kind of zigzagging and trying to figure out what their business was. Right, right, right. So each of those pivots, the question is, if you're a startup, how many pivots do you have left? Mm -hmm. 
If it turns out that some element of your business model is wrong, how long will it take you to realize that it's wrong and react? How many pivots do you know you have left? Well, you never know for sure, mm -hmm. but the, the surefire ways to extend your runway are to raise more money, right? Mm -hmm. if, let's say it takes you, you know, three months to really do a major iteration of your business. Mm -hmm. Then if you have, you know, you can do four of those. Let's say you have a year of capital for, you know, if you raise more money, then you'll have more pivots, assuming mm -hmm. you don't hire, mm -hmm. you don't slow down. Right. Um, or you could cut costs mm -hmm. if you knew which costs to cut. Or, and this is kind of a key inside of Lean Startup, you can increase the number of pivots you have left mm -hmm. by reducing the amount of time it takes you to do this feedback loop we call build, measure, learn. Mm -hmm. So if you can get a product out to customers faster, measure how they respond to that uh, product faster, mm -hmm. and more importantly, learn from that experience to figure out it's time to pivot. If you can reduce the amount of time it takes you to do that complete feedback loop, then it's like you magically have more runway. Right, Even though right. you haven't raised any extra money, you haven't hired any extra people. Right, right, right. And that feedback loop, that's the organizing principle behind the conference. The conference will be organized, build, measure, learn the same way. How do you get your employees to feel oh, as, that's the art. Yeah. As, as, I don't know, incentivized and motivated to get close that loop fast enough? And it's really hard, especially if you're hiring people who, who have not worked in startups or who worked in startups in a kind of using an older methodology mm -hmm. because most companies are organized around functional departments where people get rewarded, promoted, uh, they get bonuses based on how well they do their job, not how well do they contribute to the business's success. Mm. So a lot of programmers believe my purpose in a company is to write code and the better I write code, the more lines of code I successfully write, the more progress I'm making. Mm -hmm. Yet this mentality of build, measure, learn says it doesn't matter if you build the fastest. It doesn't matter if you measure the fastest. What matters is do you get through the full feedback loop the fastest? Build, measure, learn. Build, measure, learn. Okay. So, you know, like I used to say this kind of thing when I was an engineer. I could code faster if I didn't have to measure all this crap. Mm -hmm. I had to build all this data warehousing stuff. and exactly. pros. I used to say stuff like customers don't care if we have good reports. They only care if we have a good product. Mm -hmm. So why do I have to waste time measuring? That, that was, and, and the problem with that argument is it's true. Right. You can code faster if you don't measure right. in the same way that you can drive faster if you close your eyes right. and just you know, hit the accelerator. And the learning, is, the learning really is, are, we really, are people really adopting and people using this? And ultimately, are they, is somebody paying for it? Yeah. Uh, e e each business model has different core assumptions that have to be validated. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you take something like Facebook, where the monetization strategy was going to come later, but the like, addictive customer behavior mm -hmm. you know, was a clear indicator of product market fit. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to test, you, know, you get to be thoughtful about which assumptions do you want to test in what order. Mm -hmm. So when we say minimum viable product, mm -hmm. what we mean is the minimum amount of work required to test one of the fundamental business assumptions in the business plan. Mm -hmm. You can't test them all at the same time, Right. but we test one and we make sure that, you know, like when we did IMView, we thought the riskiest assumption in our business model was that people would pay real money for virtual clothes. Okay, now that's kind of a fashionable idea, but in mm -hmm. 2004 that was considered like really silly. I mm -hmm. mean, we were, plenty of VCs laughed us right out of their office. And we were like, okay, well let's, we were a little bit worried ourselves because, you know, we just had that big failure before and we just didn't want to have that experience again. So we yeah. said, all right, let's test that. Let's charge money from day one and make sure that this basic concept of uh, being able to pay for self-expression, that works with right, customers. that people wanted that. And that turned out to work. Mm -hmm. Because you put the minimum product out right, there. Right, we you put this minimum viable it. product. It turned out that the, the core of the avatar experience that we had mm -hmm. really worked for customers. A lot of other things we did did not work. Right. And so by putting it in customers' hands and having like clear revenue targets from day one, uh -huh. I think our first month's revenue target was like $300. Mm -hmm. So we're very small, very modest. That's yeah. what we say. When we say microscale, sure. we used to show graphs to investors and they would say, what are the units on this graph? Yeah. And we'd have to be like... <laughs> It's in ones. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is not thousands. Right? We're not showing you millions of dollars. We're talking about you know hundreds and thousands of dollars in revenue. But right. we really understood where that revenue was coming from, why customers were deciding to pay or not pay, and then we were constantly changing the product mm -hmm. to try to drive those numbers up. Right. Well, it has to start start somewhere. That's right. It's better to start small too, because you can make mistakes and it won't That's be right. so costly. Wait, what percentage of startups succeed? with this approach? Oh, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Yeah, first it's, the start. It's to really get tricky. Well I mean, first, there's a bunch of confounding factors that make it hard to answer that question. The first is that this is new. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah. we're, we're, we're trying to get people, I mean, I, I, I literally only did my first public speech about the Lean Startup basically one year ago. Yeah. Okay, so I, I mean, 
I was afraid to talk about it in public because people would laugh at me. You know. I yeah, was, I, I remember. I think I spoke with you before you started really going on the yeah, road. Yeah, right. I mean, nobody knew about it, that. and it was you know it was very early. so. So we're way too early for there to be clear evidence, mm -hmm. and we're trying to get people to become early adopters of this model, which means they're people who believe that they by taking a risk on a new way of working can get a competitive advantage. People who want to wait for the academic research to prove that this is a good idea or not, you know, in the meantime, what are you going to, you know, which model are you going to use? Right. But the other confounding factor is that um, changing the way you work as an entrepreneur doesn't guarantee success. Uh, I've been using the World Series of Poker as a metaphor lately. Oh, interesting. You know, where professional poker players increase their odds of winning in a given hand and therefore can make a lot of money as a mm -hmm. professional. Mm -hmm. And yet if you ask yourself in any given tournament with 5,000 players, w what's your probability of winning? I mean, I think it's been like eight years since a professional won the World Series of Poker. Mm -hmm. It's always an amateur. Hmm. And so I can see how people decide, hey, an amateur won, I'm an amateur, therefore I should do what they did. Right, right, right. Because I mean, it's like playing the lottery. Somebody has to win. Somebody has to win. Exactly. But just because somebody was successful as an entrepreneur doesn't mean that if you do what they did, you'll be successful. Right. Because everything in entrepreneurship is a combination of probabilities. So right. there's a certain amount of luck involved, there's a certain amount of determination involved there. And then people also forget the core vision matters a great deal. Right. So no amount of metrics and learning can help you if you don't have the passion around actually changing the world for the better. Right. And I always say, if you're in entrepreneurship to make money, please do something else. Right. There's so much better ways to make money. Right, right, right. And you have to be happy. There's this guy who just wrote a story in Inc. and he said, you know, ultimately just be lazy, meaning don't look at what other people are doing, just enjoy what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Although that's not what you preach, being lazy. You need to be, you need to work. <laughs> well, so. spending your energy well. So spending you don't get a gold star. Well. Are, we're working hard. Okay, Eric, we're going to talk about metrics. That's a big thing. Focusing yes. on metrics in our next segment. We're also going to talk about Eric's own lessons that he's <laughs> learned over time and the cardinal sin of community management and what that is. Stick around, Eric. I've been speaking with Eric Race. I'm Bambi Francisco.